Welcome to Automating Your Haunted Dungeon with OSGI. It's going to be a uh, brief overview of uh, introduction to OSGI. I have a, a few little slides at the beginning, but it's mostly code demos to show how you would uh, get started with OSGI and get some of the concepts of OSGI and hopefully take it home and, uh, and use it for your own dungeons. <laughs> Anyways, um, my name is Kevin Fonner. And I'm an enterprise systems developer with Babcock and Wilcox. Um, I do J2E development and stuff, and we use OSGI with that. But my real passion is with uh, robotics and electronic systems and hardware control systems, some embedded development. I got started with OSGI doing home automation back in 2000. And that's actually around when OSGI, OSGI was conceived, like in like 98 or 99, by Sun and a, a consortium of other companies. They developed it for the home automation market, the embedded gateway market, like that. And it was this nice little compact embedded framework that allowed you to dynamically update things in place. And since then, um, uh, uh, it's really grown beyond that um, and is used in everything from embedded in cars to J2E application servers. Anyways, quick introduction about myself is I really like Halloween. And this is my haunted dungeon that I set up every year as my wife. My wife is nice enough to look away as I move the front room furniture out of the uh, front room. And uh, I erect these foam walls. And this is the first year of the dungeon like that. And this was the year that I had real pumpkins around the outside. And I actually used real candles that year. And then I thought live flames and foam walls didn't go so well together. So the next year, um, I switched to just, I still had real pumpkins, but I used little cheap LED candles and stuff. But I added a, uh, a tunnel that you can see right back here, and it goes uh, into the kitchen. It has a barrel vaulted ceilings and a groin vault. Um, the architecture is better than my house. Anyways, the third year I got kind of industrious, and I started prototyping, and I came up with a little cir pumpkin circuit that I put together. And it's got three LED, uh, three yellow, three red, and three blue LEDs. And it has an AVR microcontroller. And I control it using Java and OSGI. Uh, the firmware on the chip's actually C, but uh, OSGI is how I control it. The pumpkins hooked together, daisy chained, with on an RS-485 network, which if those of you who know what RS-485 is, it's a multi-point serial protocol that was very popular. It was much cheaper than putting Ethernet chips in all of them. Anyways, um, you guys are really here to find out about OSGI. And so, what is OSGI? Well, OSGI is a specification for a framework that implements a dynamic component model allowing you to make modular applications. Which, you know, what OSGI is, is the, it's a specification and there are a number of companies that have OSGI uh, 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 frameworks, or they have OSGI embedded in their products. And if uh, you're using an OSGI framework or a product with OSGI embedded into it, what it really allows you to do is break up your application into these little bundles called modules. Uh, uh, modules called bundles. And inside these bundles, these bundles are just jar files. And inside the jar files are just Java classes, maybe some other jars and libraries that the uh, bundles need. Um, some other resources that they need, and most importantly to OSGI, a uh, manifest file, and inside the manifest file has some OSGI properties which describe the bundle to the OSGI framework and basically tells the OSGI framework what to do with the bundle. Anyways, um, so quick example of like what you would use OSGI for, say you have like a complex app and this is like one application, you have like four features, uh, feature you know, and you, uh, all these features use a utility library. And, uh, and that's great, and this is one app, so it's all running on one JVM sharing a class path. And you want to update feature D so it uses a new utility library. Well, if, that's, uh, if they're all sharing the same class path, in a lot of cases they are, um, what happens is, uh, at the very least, you'd have to regression test your other features inside your application. At the very worst, you might have to go back and make modifications to the other features, and uh, 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 so that uh, uh, and then regression test those. 
There are ways of loading more than one version of a jar or package, I should say, that in, into the same class path. However, a lot of these are fraught with a lot of issues. Well, one of the things that OSGI allows you to do is each bundle has its own class path. And that class path is actually wired up dynamically at runtime. And so it's, and it also provides a mechanism for the various different bundles to communicate back and forth without having to be, uh, without having to share the same class path. It provides some mechanisms for more focused sharing, as you'll see. And, uh, and what this basically allows it, you is you can upgrade uh, part of your application and keep it very modularized and update to a newer version of the library. And half your app can be running on one version of the library, and half your app can be running on another version of the library. And it doesn't really provide, and, and there won't be really any kind of uh, class path conflicts like you might have to deal with. And, uh, uh, and that's in a nutshell what OSGI is, is allowing you to break it up and have individual class paths and provide mechanisms for the uh, OSGI framework to, for the bundles to communicate back and forth. Anyways, it's easier, I find, uh, if you just go ahead and uh, work through the examples on code. So that's what we're going to do, and I hope that's all right. I'm going to go ahead and we're going to create a, a framework to control the pumpkins um, from scratch here. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a project. And we're going to use a plugin project. And that's like a, an Eclipse plugin. And the reason why is because Eclipse actually runs on top of OSGI, an uh, OSGI framework called Equinox. And that's one of the OSGI frameworks that I like to use. And so, one second. I had to change some of my screen resolution stuff and it threw me off a little bit. And so we're going to be creating a new pumpkin service, which is going to control the framework. And see, you'll see some properties right here. And these properties are basically uh, uh, properties that will get put into the manifest file for OSGI. And you have a ID for the bundle, and you have a version number for the bundle, and you have a name of the bundle, and you can specify a vendor. You can specify an execution environment if you want to. And then right here is specified a class, an activator. And the activator is actually the class that gets instantiated by the OSGI framework, which allows your bundle to, uh, um, to start and stop, as you'll see here. And so I'm going to go ahead and modify a few things here. And here you can see your manifest file, and it has the standard Java manifest version. But here's your OSGI specific ones. Bundle manifest version 2, which is really just a manifest version number for OSGI. Bundle name, bundle symbolic name, which is important. Your bundle version number, and the activator, which is what the class that gets instantiated inside your OSGI bundle. And this import package, which we'll get to uh, in a little bit more later. But right now we're going to focus on the activator. And inside, the activator. There's two key methods that are important or like that. This start and this stop method inside the activator. Uh, the bundle context object is passed to the uh, uh, activator class, which implements the bundle activator. And this bundle context object is important. You want to maintain a hold of that. That's why uh, it gets stored inside this class. This is how you communicate back to the OSGI framework to do various different operations. But this is a simple example. We're just going to print line, started the pumpkin service, and then shut down the pumpkin service. And so I have a couple of ant scripts that are just going to help us out along the way. And what they're basically doing is just jarring up the files that I build or like that, and sticking the manifest in there so that uh, I can load it into the OSGI framework. And so I'm going to start up an OSGI framework. And a lot of times, you would just be using a uh, application like a J2E application server or another product um, to, uh, and using the OSGI facilities inside that. Or if you were building a product, you'd have startup scripts to start up OSGI. Um, what we're going to be doing is just running uh, the OSGI Equinox framework right from the command line to keep things simple. 
and I can type in uh, uh, various different controls and stuff. You can type in help and it has various different commands and stuff that you can interact with the OSGI framework. And the first thing that we're going to be doing is installing that bundle that we just built. And we get a bundle ID and it shows that the, bun the pumpkin service is installed and we're going to start one. Oh, did I forget to save it? My bad. And so we can also teach you the update command to update one. And you can see that it printed started the pumpkin service. And I can stop one. So that's really exciting. That's your first bundle. But that's, that just gets us going. Now we want our bundle to start doing stuff. One of the things that's nice is sharing classes and stuff. So we're going to create a class that we're going to share with another bundle. And it's just going to be a test class. And inside this test class, we're going to have a method that says print test call. And it's just going to print out, this is boring but useful. But we're also going to go inside the manifest file to make this available to other people. And we're going to export that package. It specifies in the OSGI manifest to export the pumpkin service to the OSGI framework for other bundles to consume. So now we're going to go ahead and create another plugin. And this is going to be the pumpkin controller, which is going to control the pumpkins. And we have version 1.0 of it. There's our activator, our manifest. And now what's important with this one is we're now going to import this package. And I could specify a version number much like this OSGI framework if I wanted to, but we just are concerned with importing the, uh, pump, the pumpkin service. And I'm going to, in the activator of the pumpkin controller, we're going Now, inside the activator, you'll see that just like standard Java, you would like if as if the other bundle was in our class path, we're just going to import the pumpkin service test class. And then we're going to go ahead and create an instance of test and print the test call. This is all straight Java. Pretty simple, straightforward stuff. And I'm going to update one. So we started the pumpkin service, and we start two. This is boring but useful. So one of the interesting things, I don't know if, if you realize just happened there though, is bundle one and bundle two had completely separate class paths. They both load into the OSGI framework, and they're running within their own class paths. And then what happens is you specify inside your manifest file that you want to export this package and it specify uh, in the bundle two that you wanted to import this package. And what happens is the OSGI framework on the fly wires up the class paths so that the packages in one are available in two. And so if you had bundle three, it wouldn't necessarily see the package exported unless it wanted to see that. If you wanted to, you could say, import me a version of this package that's higher than this version number. And the OSGI framework will then search for a version number that's hot, uh, th for what you requested and will automatically wire that version of the bundle up to the class path of that bundle. So let's go ahead and make our pumpkin service that much more interesting now. So we're going to add some libraries to it. And what this is that I'm placing 
is just a serial port driver. It's what I use to communicate with the pumpkins. And I'm going to add it to our path. Okay. Then I'm going to add a couple more OSGI headers to the pumpkin service. Now what's neat about, well, we're wiring up the bundle, the, I add to the class path for the bundle, the, the serial port driver. And then when this is a kind of a neat OSGI header, the, um, OSGI manifest property is that these are native drivers and you can specify the processor number and the OS number and uh, the OS name and the OSGI framework um, will examine the operating system that the bundle gets installed on and then automatically wire up uh, the, uh, the link the dynamic libraries appropriate for the OS that are for your bundle to the operating system. So if you're doing hardware type development it's kind of nice and that's kind of where OSGI came from. Anyway, so the next thing is we're going to continue evolving our pumpkin service. And we are going to create a new interface. Called pumpkin service. So that other people can And inside this interface, we're going to specify a method, call command. This is how I actually communicate with the pumpkins. There's an address byte, which is each pumpkin has an individual address. A command byte is uh, passed, which tells it to turn on or flicker or turn off. And then there is a parameter byte to tell it to, usually for like a color, to flicker blue or flicker red or turn on red, so that I use those when I'm calling it. Now, we're going to create a new class for the control software for the actual pumpkins and this is where I'll, this is our implementation logic and actually I meant to put this into another spot are being goofy. That was actually meant to be in a different package namespace. There we go. And so what I'm doing is I'm putting our implementation outside of the package that we exported because what happens is we don't want people to really expose this to the rest of the OSGI framework. And what's inside this pumpkin implementa service implementation class is code to initialize the serial port, close the command port, and also implements the interface that we just wrote um, to output out via the serial port the address byte, the command byte, and the parameter byte. Anyway, so we're going to go ahead and add new stuff to our pumpkin controller activator. We're going to be exposing. We're going to be exposing this as a pumpkin service to the rest of the OSGI framework. And so now, what's important is that inside the start bundle, we create a new implementation of our pumpkin service implementation. We initialize the communications. And then we register a service with the name of the pumpkin service. And, and that gets registered and then print out that we started the pumpkin service. And also, one thing I forgot is our activator does not need to be 
in the interface, so it's best to put that in the implementation. So I'm moving it back out of the class that we exported to the rest of the OSGI framework. Now we're going to go ahead into the pumpkin controller and go to the activator. And inside the pumpkin uh, uh, control framework, when the bundle starts up, we're going to look for the pumpkin service reference that we exported with the uh, pumpkin service. And we're going to do a query against that. And we get an instance of the pumpkin service object, and we can call commands then across of it. And we're going to send out a 0 to address all the pumpkins, an O for it to turn it on, and a B to turn it blue. We're going to build that. Now I'm going to, because I loaded some native libraries, I'm going to stop these. I'm going to reload those. And so now, when we start three, the serial port driver gets started up from the first bundle. Did I mess up somewhere? I'm working on a different screen resolution than I meant. Sorry, guys. Hmm. That sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I really haven't had this problem through the demo yet. Exception. Hmm. Let me just make sure that I update. One second, let me check my <coughs> code notes real quick here. My code notes normally I could see them a little better. Control. Activator.
<laughs> well, I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, I went through this three times a day, and it didn't do that one time. Hmm? Yeah, I did have that on there, but I haven't had to do that lately. Yeah. Um. Oh, I guess I did have to restart the pump OSGI module. I'm sorry, guys. Okay, that was all it was. Um, normally, lately in the demo, I hadn't had to do that. Anyways, <laughs> so if we run that demo, wow, I can't believe that. I'll go ahead and reset those. So now, when we start seven, it changes all the pumpkins to a blue. And what happened was that uh, the service was registered with the OSGI framework, and uh, then the pumpkin control framework then consumed that service and uh, 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 started, uh, uh, sent the command to turn all the pumpkins blue. And what that allows is you to abstract away the class paths of the, uh, uh, the, the class paths are hidden away between the different bundles, but expose a service interface that still allows your OSGI bundles to loosely couple talk back and forth. Anyways, all right, let's see if I can actually get somewhere. I'm just gonna leave those open. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to demonstrate. So that's great that that pumpkin service is available for us and that the OSGI bundle can communicate with it. Um, but what happens is in the enterprise world or in the embedded world, we have constant communications going on. And, uh, uh, and we're going to have to handle if the service were to disappear. And to, so to simulate that, we're going to set up uh, 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 the uh, possibility for a service failure and handle that. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add to the pumpkin control framework, we're going to add something to randomize the light, the lights. So now you get to see my code samples rather than having them crammed off the screen. And what this uh, class does is it simply, it's a timer task, which goes heads and uh, sends a random address byte and a parameter byte, which is actually the color of the pumpkin or like that, to control the pumpkin. And then what happens is we're going to go ahead and modify the activator to call that timer task. And so inside the start bundle here, we're just going to go ahead and get the service reference and then we're going to go ahead and set schedule for every 100 milliseconds to randomize the lights. And so, we're going to update 7. Now you can see the pumpkins are the pumpkin controllers basically sending a random address byte and a color. And so the pumpkins are changing colors. So, so now what we have is a system that is continually changing. The controller is continuing sending transmissions to the pumpkin service. Now, we can't really just have the pump, if the pumpkin service might go offline because in the enterprise world you might take down that particular feature of the application. You need to, you want the controller to be able to respond uh, to changes in the OSGI framework. And the OSGI framework makes that easy, is they have a utility called the OSGI tracker, which we're going to go ahead and import in the manifest. And we're going to modify our pumpkin controller. Oh, we're going to implement a copy of the service tracker. New class. We're going to create the pumpkin service tracker. And Inside this pumpkin service tracker, it extends the service tracker, which is provided by the OSGI framework. We tell the service tracker what kind of service that we're interested in. We want, we're interested in a service 
with this name, the pumpkin server cl service class name. And then there is two methods that are important, the adding service, um, which happens when the pumpkin service becomes available. And then there's the remove service, when the, uh, uh, when the pumpkin service obviously disappears. And so what we're going to do is we're going to modify our activator then to deal with that. Use the pumpkin service tracker. And inside this, our start bundle has gotten a little simpler like that. It just simply creates an instance of that pumpkin service tracker. And then opens it up. So we'll build that. And we'll update 7 in place. Pumpkin service available. So what happens is that OSGI bundle stopped and then started again when I updated it and immediately recognized that the pumpkin service was already loaded into the framework. And so it told me it was available and it created the timer task to start uh, running. But I can stop the pumpkin uh, service, the pumpkin service, and the service tracker automatically gets notified or the you know, service tracker automatically knows that the pumpkin service got stopped and lets my application know so that it can take the appropriate steps. And where this is really cool is, is say like in the enterprise space or like that, you create a Java, uh, uh, you create a bundle to handle uh, uh, a set of applications in your enterprise and you have a front page and that front page is managed by one bundle and then you have other applications with other bundles. And say that, so then what happens is you want to take down one of your applications. Well, that front page has links to all your different applications. Well, what happens is if you have the front page, which is a bundle, with a service tracker that's tracking your other applications that are loading your OSGI framework, you can have the front page automatically get notified when that bundle goes down and change the hyperlink so that it's disabled and posts a notice to the front page that notifies that that application is currently offline and uh, and as soon as you bring that application that bundle back online then the uh, service tracker will automatically kick into gear and your front page will then display a link to the application and so um, it makes uh, applications where you might take down pieces of it and have multiple pieces running at the same time it makes it really easy to uh, have pieces go down and up and the other components that rely on that system to automatically uh, adapt to what's running inside the system. Anyways, so let's go ahead and create a Groovy bundle. Um, I'm going to cre uh, uh, create a Groovy bundle and one of the nice things is that Groovy it has OSGI headers already in it. And so we're just going to install that. This is just the standard Groovy jar file. And so there are lots of Java classes that have OSGI headers, Java libraries that have OSGI headers in them. And we're going to go ahead and create the Groovy controller. Equinox framework. And it's going to have its activator. However, I'm going to change that to a Groovy class after we get going. Inside the manifest file, I'm going to take the shotgun approach to this. And this is going to be the manifest file for our Groovy controller, which imports all the Groovy libraries. pieces, the packages from the Groovy library. And we're going to, inside the Groovy controller, we're going to replace that with a Groovy class.
And so we have Groovy Bundle Activator started, Groovy Bundle Activator stopped. And we're going to install the Groovy Bundle that we just created. And you can see the Groovy Bundle Activator started. So what happens is I wanted you to see how easy, because a lot of people these days look, view JV, the JVM, uh, Java Virtual Machine, much more as a platform for all sorts of different languages. And so we're coding in JRuby and Groovy and Jython. Um, and, uh, and so it's very easy to do even OSGI from the other, some of the other languages. Um, even uh, Scala um, uh, all seems to work very well. Anyways, so I'm going to go ahead and we're going to extend our pumpkin service class just a little farther. And I'm going to import something to make up for some time here. And I'm going to create, uh, I'm going to be importing an audio service. And what the audio service is, is remember I created a pumpkin service interface. And uh, that's what we utilize to communicate with the actual pumpkins. However, I wanted to show that you can utilize, uh, you can create other uh, classes that implement that interface and then categorize the service and I'll, I'll elaborate that a little bit more. What happens is this uh, audio service implements the pumpkin service interface. You can see and instead of controlling the pumpkins it's controlling music playback and uh, inside the activator we're going to go ahead and register another instance of the pumpkin service class. However, we're going to attach some properties to the registration of the pumpkin service to distinguish it from the, the pumpkin service which controls the pumpkins. So I attach a property that says service type and that's audio. Well, then what happens is I'm going to add a property to our pumpkin service that's actually controlling our pumpkins. And you can see I'm, I'll attach, I'm now adding a property when I register as service, as service type light. Now where this comes in handy is you can write, a, if you're developing an application, an, say like an enterprise application, and, uh, and you want to develop an encryption service that other bundles can use inside your company. You can develop an interface that says, uh, that uh, standardizes the interface for the encryption service. And then you'll write a bundle which implements the AES encryption service. And then you can attach a property of uh, encryption algorithm is equal to AES. Well then later on down the road you could write a bundle which implements the encryption algorithm of uh, Blowfish 2. And so you could attach a property then for uh, saying that it's an encryption type is Blowfish 2. But your interface is standard across all that. And then so one bundle client might, that would be implemented might simply say, give me, a, give me an encryption service or like that. And the OSGI, I don't care what kind it is. And so the OSGI framework, you can do a query against the system and it will return uh, just any old encryption service that first comes back and then you can call it and encrypt your data. However, you might say, I prefer the Blowfish too, so I'm going to see if that happens. And you can do a query against the OSGI framework, then that uh, lists based on properties of your encryption services that are registered with the OSGI framework and it will let you know whether a Blowfish 2 uh, exists. And then you can decide whether you want to report an error or whether you want to fall back to a different encryption service that is registered with the system. Anyways, so we're going to go ahead and register that. Now I'm going to go ahead in preparations to make sure that stuff doesn't fail here at the end. I don't have any repeats. 
That was a disaster. I'm going to stop some stuff. Sometimes when you're messing with some of the native libraries, like I'm doing with the hardware control stuff, you have to uh, be a little bit more careful how you clean stuff up. It's forewarning if any of you guys are going to be automating your own dungeon props. And so I'm going to install the pumpkin service. Let's go in our register. That's always great. Well, I meant to start the uh, uninstall. uninstall. Did I not run the install command? Exit. Let's start that again. Install. Ah, all right. There's our uh, audio module. Thank you, by the way, you yelled out that. <laughs> and you can see that we have, we have uh, uh, two pumpkin services registered with the system, and we can query against the OSGI framework, typing services, and you can pass in queries to the services. And you can see that we have two pumpkin services that are registered, one that has the service type light and one that has the service type audio. And you'll see what I mean, how I use this in the finale, which hopefully works good. We're going to update the Groovy controller here one last time. Import these libraries. And basically what I added here was this line at the bottom here for the pumpkin service to import that. And we're going to create a new Groovy class animation. Now what this Groovy class animation is going to be doing is going to be opening up a file that I have of timings and playback the animation, sending the commands to the service. And then we're going to modify the activator here for the Groovy bundle. Now you'll notice that inside my <laughs> Groovy activator, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm doing a query for get all the service references so I'm getting all the pumpkin service references. And what happens is I'm sticking them into a collection um, uh, keyed by the service type. And so what that allows me to do is when I play back my animation file, and I'll show you that right real quick here, I have timings here of the uh, when to control the pumpkins. And then I have the property that I'm looking for the service type. And so it allows me just to loop through these timings or like that and make a call to the OSGI framework uh, uh, from my collection. I grab the service reference of the pumpkin service that is uh, controlling the light and the audio. And then I send the command and the parameter and the byte. And so I'm going to do that. And I'm going to install the Groovy 
Oh, and I'm going to plug in the audio here. And we'll start 12. And then so it's looping through the timings and controlling the bumpkin. Anyways, um, that went a little rougher than I was hoping it would. I hope you guys uh, got something out of it. And uh, 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 do you have any questions now? Uh, yeah, if you go to kevin.fonder.net, I have uh, some details of me building the pumpkins. Yes? I think that manifest file seems to be a lily. Is there any tools for on that in the imports and exports? There are some tools out there I, uh, that uh, uh, bind tools um, put out by somebody, um, if you search for that. Um, it helps you manage the manifest file. Um, it, it, there are some people who have developed some utilities that are kind of the, uh, what is it, convention over, no, yeah, convention over configuration, where if you lay out your code in a special way and use that tool, it makes a lot of assumptions and builds your manifest file for you. Do you tend to run it manually? Just I tend to do it manually. I, I, it's probably more habit than anything, because when I started OSGI, uh, none of that existed. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yes? Yes, um, I'll put it up here, and uh, when I give the slide to Oracle or like that, um, I have the demo, because uh, they'll have the presentation up on there, and uh, 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 you can't really demo all the failures I did today. And so, uh, <laughs> so what happens is you can go and see the source code, that's all there. So, but you'll have to solder your own pumpkins together. Yes? Have you ever come across or used the sensor or unit part in OSGI? The unit part? I, I'm sorry. Yeah, no. There's a, a sensor library. I think it's called OSGI measurement. Have you no, I haven't utilized that yet, but I, I've, I've, done, I've read about it a little bit. Oh, and that's one thing that he brings up a good point. There are tons of OSGI bundles and libraries out there for doing lots of various different things with the OSGI framework. And so I've really just scratched the surface about kind of like what the core OSGI does. Um, but there are bundles for entire web servers that you can load up and then use to serve out web pages and security frameworks and authentication. And there's OSGI specifications for a lot of that and built-in logging and all these other stuff. And so there's a lot out there. But this was just to give you guys a kind of an idea of the concept. Yes? If you do an uninstall, does it actually unload the class or the, if, I have, if we have a running system, which is always running, mm -hmm. you cannot bring the system down, which means when you say Java dash jar and OSGI framework that, if you start that OSGI, we should always have our system running. Yes. That so do we have the old classes in memory in the JVM or it is gone when you do an uninstall? It's gone off the JVM. Or like that. However, there are some other different OSGI frameworks out there, and there's some of that stuff is up to interpretation of the implementation. And so, if that's something that you're interested in, I would advise double checking that and running some tests with the OSGI framework that you end up going with. Um, I tend to use Equinox, which is what powers Eclipse. Um, and seems to be pretty clean, um, but the, uh, depending on how small or large your framework is, there's lots of other choices, as well as utilities to help manage it. Yes? How will this uh, start translating when you start doing clustering or multi-server? Does this start translate at all into that, or does this only deal with a particular server? It, t it tends to be just a particular server. What happens is, though, you, uh, you would end up utilizing some of the tools that are best in that category as OSGI bundles. And so each, you'd have an OSGI bundle framework running on each of those systems, and the bundle could come up, and depending on you know, what, what your clustering software is doing or like that, it would come into memory. The OSGI bundle is really for maintaining what's running on that particular JVM. 
Any other questions? The yeah, export, does it export the whole package? Everything there? Or can you fine tune it like uh, one class? Or I think you can fine tune that down to a specific class. I tend to do it at the package level to break things out. Um, I, again, though, it's I think it's OSGI implementation specific. They've been they equi. But what, what I say that is like Equinox adds. I I use the Equinox framework, and Equinox adds a lot of features specific for Eclipse. And so I can't remember off the top of my head what the actual OSGI implementation says, and stuff. And so I would I would check into that. But uh, um, I've always tended to do it at the package level, and all the. Uh, tutorials and stuff that I have gone through over the years tended to do it that way at the package level. It's pretty easy to separate out your classes that you want to expose just into separate packages. Yes? If two bundles both use the same third-party library, but they're on different versions, can one import the other bundle without the conflict of the other library that they're both using? Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. What happens is, if they're both in, what happens is that library would have its own package space. And so if one bundle, if both bundles are using, say, let's, for simple, simplicity, is using package A, and the, uh, and the, but they want to, uh, but bundle A, one, wants to export package B to bundle two, like that, well, if bundle A, because bundle A, uh, one, would have to export that package, right? And so what happens is if it exported package A, was that confusing? I hope not. <laughs> or like that. If it, 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 when you, you have to export, that's why they do it at the package level. You have to be very explicit. And that's why when you saw my OSGI, um, not, not my OSGI, my Groovy bundle, I had to import every single package. It, it's not nested packages or anything else. So if, a, if, a, if a, one bundle has multiple things in its class path, and it exports only a specific package, it's, it, that's all it, it, it uh, exports. Not even the nested ones, just directly what's inside that package name. Actually, that's one of my pet peeves that you have to do, even the nested package names. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. So you have a really fine-grained amount of control about what you export and what you import. And the OSGI framework takes place at wiring up on the runtime what that bundle needs, whether, you know, Ver different versions of the library, what, what not. Yes? When you're using a third-party kind of component embedded, um, do you like go to its exports and use that as imports as you did with the um, library that you were using? Do you just take them all, or do you like pick and choose? Like, you can pick and choose at times. It's you know, Like I said, I took the shotgun approach or like that to uh, uh, get the uh, demonstration together I like that. Um, and ten also because I uh, tend to cut and paste that groovy code around a lot because when I'm writing groovy bundles I want to have everything available to me. But what happens is you can pick and choose down to just specifics. And, uh, and with third party libraries if they're utilizing OSGI manifest headers inside their jar, and a lot of them are I like that, um, you can uh, splice apart the jar and take a look at what they're exporting. And if for some reason somebody doesn't have a, if their jar, their library is not OSGI compliant right there, you can just simply wrap that, their library, inside another one of your jars and then export the package. And then so it makes it really easy to turn any library that is not OSGI ready right out of the box into an OSGI ready library. That's actually pretty easy. Yeah, that's that's why the uh, uh, are you, if you're talking about just libraries or whether you're talking about services with OSGI. I mean, services mainly, and then, um, you know, like for sometimes with the services, it gets really easy because they provide the service tracker library that I demonstrated, and it makes it really nice for your bundle to examine. Uh, 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 to automatically examine what's running inside the system and to respond accordingly, whether that means shutting down or, or just simply turning off features it's not using on the fly. Uh, and then once that service returns back, automatically adjusting and then running again. Um, if it's with libraries, um, it kind, I guess it, it, it just, the manifest 
you know, is not as dynamic, you'd have to shut down the bundle and bring it back up or like that. Um, and a lot of times if a dependency isn't found, the bundle will, you know, throw an error um, and that would be up to you to handle. Yes? Is it possible to nest the bundles? Or, so like a feature and sub-feature, I want to be able to, to share sub-features within the feature but not outside of that? Inside the with inside the bundle? So I, look, let's say I've got some major features, mm -hmm. three or four major features, and inside of each of those features, I have sub-features that I want to be able to export the services within the, the major feature but not a, any of the other A bundle features. hierarchy, you mean? Um, no, I really haven't seen anything about that. Um, no, it's mostly set to be pretty loosely coupled so that you register things with the OSGI framework or like that um, and import, you know, import it. If it's your own library or like that, well then, uh, uh, um, no, once it's exported onto the OSGI framework, it's free game for the rest of the OSGI framework, as far as I know. Another way you could hide things is by declaring them internal, but then they wouldn't be bundles exposed. They would only be used internally within your feature. Yeah, that's that's you. If you put all the features within a single bundle, you know that would give you hierarchy or like that. But then that, I, but I, I assume that you wanted the the bundle capabilities. Yes. Um, I think you could be able to do that. Um, I, there's nothing built in to do that. You'd have to do it manually. But uh, uh, I don't see anything that would prevent you from doing that, if I understood your question correctly. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, have you investigated like, Felix? Or, or do you pick Equinox over Felix? Or is it just like really early Equinox you are kind of like, there are reasons why you're picking Equinox over Equinox is what I went to after. Uh, oh, it, I haven't really investigated uh, Felix an awful lot. And so. I see no reason. One of the things I like about Felix is it's, I think it's closer to the standard OSGI specification. Uh, Equinox uh, tends to include a lot of Eclipse's own stuff that they want to utilize. And so every once in a while, I've thought about going to Felix in order to stay closer to OSGI. Um, but uh, I just really haven't made the switch or like that. Equinox is what I naturally went to. I was on Sun's JES server when they came out with it. And then I went to... Uh, uh, something called Knoppler Fish, I think, and then uh, and then uh, Equinox, and that's just where I've stayed so far. Any other questions? Thank you very much. It's been a. I hope you guys got something out of it. <laughs>